Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, believe it by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome back to the World of Martial Arts show. I'm here with my co-hosts, Mick and Kurt. And today we're talking about the relationship between martial arts and travel, whether that's teaching or training, going to seminars and retreats, or just visiting other gyms, whether that's a friend's gym or sometimes you rock up to a city and you go in and you do a session. Um, So Mick, I guess you've traveled around the UK and abroad too. Uh, Have you got any thoughts on like the benefits of traveling and training? Well, benefits, dead easy. Uh, you, you getting out there into the world, and especially in martial arts, isn't it a great thing to be able to go out there and see this culture that you've read about? And, you you know, if you're lucky enough, you know, which I have been in some cases, to go to the birthplace of that martial art. Exactly like you said, the idea of this is always maybe priority one for me is getting an expanded or a new perspective on things. And that's part of what what you're talking about. You even use that word, you know, if you're going to the source of an art, if we're talking about training karate in Japan, I'm not, I literally just started training karate for the first time, like two weeks ago. Uh, But I I understand that the idea of that one person might go to Japan and go, man, like the, like you said, deference, right? The rigidity of this is apparent. And I don't feel like I'm getting as much out of the training as I do in my home country or my home school or whatever, because our structure and our culture and our school or our gym is a little bit different. Our dojo is different. Um, And I think that can be, especially in a Western way, can be more conducive to learning, to being open-minded and trying new things, being a little more comfortable. You know, we talk a lot about gamifying things or allowing things to be playful, being a more, um, I don't know, like more fertile soil for learning. And for me, I know that that's true. Conversely, though, where I might disagree with you, Mick, is the idea then of going to one of those places and understanding the why behind that structure and rigidity and going, right, but that country isn't my country. That culture isn't, if, if, it, if I'm not Japanese, which I'm not, you know, isn't my uh, culture. And so now I'm able to understand why they approach it this way. When you and I traveled in Japan, Mick, one thing that was apparent to me, we taught martial art there, albeit it was mostly Filipino martial art, but the way that a group of Japanese students, as an example, behaved seemed, the class felt like a group of karate students in that way. And hopefully I'm not minimizing anybody, but felt like a group of karate, high level karate students in the way that they listened, the way that they kind of fell into a structure in the room itself without that being dictated. The focus on poise and control in quality of movement was so much different that is to say focus on body mechanics was so much different than what I know I was trying to bring to the table or what my experience had been beforehand and so that has allowed me that was one of the reasons I wanted now as an adult to start to learn karate because I realized there's a lot I don't understand about this there's things I assumed about it and traveling helped me kind of see behind the curtain and understand you know 
what you see isn't always what it is because you're seeing it obviously through your own eyes and through your own perspective. That's my favorite part to traveling, whether it's to train, which is mostly why I've traveled or to teach, which I've done as well, uh, is to be able to get exposed to that other side of the equation and understand that uh, my take on it isn't the only take and it's, <clears throat> it's gonna remain my take, but it's more enriching to me to be able to dip my toe in different pools. It's interesting what you're saying there about um, Japanese students. I was training with Billy Robinson when he was in America and I was over with Billy, the old catch wrestler. And he's, he spent years teaching in Japan. And then he taught in America for a long time as well. And he told me the difference was if you're teaching in America and they're drilling a technique, uh, you turn away and you turn back and they've stopped doing the move. And he said, if you're in Japan and they're doing the move, you might leave the room, come back and you have to tell them to stop. Like, cause they just kept going and kept going the whole time. He said there was a real, real difference in it there. Um, one of the interesting things I like, you both kind of took a different perspective of seeing a different place. I think that's part of it. It's, it's like the, the travel as a whole will affect you, but it's what you take on the travel as well. And I don't know what you guys are like traveling. Like I'm quite an anxious person and I've got a bad back and stuff. I find traveling the, the discomfort of it is quite difficult. I find it's quite stressful but it does a lot for me. Like, especially when you end up in a, in a, a, a fresh gym and you end up sparring with somebody you don't know. And like, I remember like being in like Arkansas in like a sweaty gym and you just rolling with some brown belt who's like been a wrestler and stuff and you're sliding all over the place and you're like, people are watching because you're the, you're the guy from who's come from somewhere else. And, and it's, it's quite nerve wracking to be doing that, to be traveling somewhere and trying something. But obviously there, of course, there's growth in that, you know. Also, side well, note, only a martial artist are like, so I spent some time in America. Where'd you go? Arkansas. What? Why? I've cornered fight. I've cornered fights in like Vegas and North Carolina. Sure, I know. Florida, that's places. the interesting thing though. Like, because was, a place like Arkansas will give you exposure to even a different part of America than Detroit where I live or, you know what I mean? And martial art gives you the opportunity to go into places that a tourist might not otherwise even consider going to. Oh, it's it was a totally cool. strange story. I was at the, I was at ADCC and I, there was a, a guy there uh, Rolly Delgado and he was cornering Hillary Williams competing and I tried to chat to him and say oh actually you know one of my students is going to fight you soon but obviously that's a weird thing this was in Barcelona I was in Barcelona some random guy walks up and goes oh I'm going to be cornering against you soon and he kind of looked at me like that's what the fuck and then uh, one of my students fought him at UFC 105 and knocked him out and then afterwards he messaged me and was like man like that was a good game plan like you guys did a good job I'm going to be in the UK sometime. Shall I pop down and see you? And he came down and kicked my ass. And then uh, we did some training together. And then I gradually managed to get a little bit better with him. And then he went back to America. And he was like, you know what? I like what you do. Come over. So I went over, stayed with him. I taught there. And then he drove me over to Memphis. And I went and taught in Memphis. And went to Graceland and stuff while I was there as well. And uh, I had a little... So I don't, I, that was such a good experience. That going down to... Going, you know, being in the South you know, going and shooting some guns in someone in the garden and on some land and, you know, going out for, uh, um, you know, every, everything, yeah, everything was fried as well. Um, you know, the, all the typical stuff. But, um, and in Memphis going, going out for like barbecue and stuff there. Um, but again, that's the thing it's the culture and the food and, um, and, and seeing how people interact differently. I got to admit, gym culture is one of the big things I noticed. Like in the UK, you know, it's cold and it's wet. And I know sure people probably socialize a little bit, but they tend to go to the gym and go home. I noticed like in America, people go train in the morning, they go out for lunch together, then they'll go, you know, in the evening. And then when I've, I've taught in Germany as well, and everyone's kind of like training really late at night and maybe even going out for a drink and stuff afterwards. I think it's partly where you're based, whether you're in a city or whether you're not, whether there's stuff nearby. But I noticed in a lot of other countries, there seems to be a little bit more socializing than the UK. I don't know if you've noticed the same thing. Yeah, well, that, it's just as you were saying when you were on about Arkansas. Uh, Mark McFan is famously from Arkansas. And I, was, I used to always say, I'm going to go one day to that Arkansas place that you live in. And uh, he said, well, as long as you like red meat and guns and jujitsu. And I was like, two of the great, three of the greatest things in the world. Oh, you'd love it there, man. I mean, obviously, I went to Westside um, Gym, and the level there was just... Obviously, they've got TJ Brown in the UFC. They've got the guys in the UFC right now. Yeah. They are, 
yeah, amazing. Ro- Roll is jujitsu is off the hook, man. It's really, really good. Well, you, well you, it's funny you say it because uh, Arkansas, you know, it's t- t- to us in Europe, that's a niche place, right? So for years, everyone's going. So how long have you been going to Minneapolis? And like, obviously, right, right up until only recently, you know, what what did you know about Minneapolis? Literally, it was Prince. That 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 was it. You know, <laughs> there, there was nothing else. And then people, like, Minneapolis was the one city in the country where I was like, I don't care how beautiful it is, I'm never going there. And I wound up living there for a decade. Because, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but yeah, but you, you, like this is the crazy thing. It's like. Uh, just to give you an idea of like just how ignorant you can be of a place. I, 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 I've been going to Minneapolis maybe about six or seven years, and I, I'd heard these horror stories of the winters, you know, like where, yeah, you know, a good friend, good mutual friend of myself and Kurt Cornwells, uh, me and Kurt, uh, Mike Duffy. Mike's like gets almost clinically depressed in the wintertime because he's like, I just can't bear, I can't handle living here. And I'm like, how could you not live here? It's a fucking ace, you know, the mosquitoes get you. And they're like, no, dude, you come for like t- t- like a week or two weeks at the best time of the year. And it sucks for the rest. And I'm like, and you know, we're, we're like four seasons in one day here in the, in the UK, aren't we? You know what I mean? And you go over there, it's like, oh no, no, we have seasons here, man. You know, like literally, end of end of September, put your coat on and take it back off at the start of April. And you're like, really? And I was thinking, wow. And it's like, just just that. How would I have learned that by not doing martial arts and going there and not living there? It's super interesting that yeah, you go to places you would never normally go to because of the martial arts school that's there. Like I, you know, I, I mean, I never would have gone to Charlotte, North Carolina, if I wasn't cornering a fight. I never would have gone to Little Rock, Arkansas. But in the UK, I went to Middlesbrough a whole bunch of times, and sort of there for Jamie Taylor and the lads up there. Like, no offense to Middlesbrough, but I would never have gone up there <laughs> for any other reason other than doing teaching. I spent, you know, I've been to Stockport a few times because I've taught there. I've been to other cities around the country just because I was I was doing a seminar or because there was something on. I think you do. You do go to places you would never normally visit because of that. This makes me think of Dan and Asano, who, at least in the States, I always think of as kind of being one of, if not the pioneers for seminar teaching, right? And kind of helping to give birth to that as an option and as a movement. Um, And he's got spots he goes to that he's been going to for like 40, 45 years or whatever. And they're not New York City. They're not Chicago. They're not Los Angeles. Well, he lives there. You know, they're like little middle of nowhere towns in Indiana or Illinois, you know, just like White Pines, so like city names where you're like, what is that? That's got to be in the middle of nowhere. But in the beginning, those were the places he'd go to. Now that it's expanded so much, you know, and the idea of seminar touring has expanded so much, you think of going to these maybe more popular, more metropolitan areas, but you get some of these guys who still go to the original spots and it's exciting to go there because the town was basically, you know, a couple of gas stations, a couple of restaurants, and then Dan and Asano shows up every year. Like, holy shit, you know, that's a pretty significant thing, not for the town, but for the martial artists in that town to have that opportunity and all of a sudden to see people from around the country start to like congregate in their area and, and use up their couple hotels that they've got nearby. Uh, I think that's sort of interesting the way that that, that can still persist. I remember reading about this like fable smoky mountain martial arts camp <laughs> and you see these adverts and I swear to God, you look at these now and you, like, you look at the lineup and you think, this would have been the greatest action movie ever if some guy had have walked in there, you know? Um, it was, you know, if you, we use an example, that a personal example that myself and Kurt know, uh, Lake Owen in uh, Wisconsin. Like, th- this is this is the thing. Wis- Wisconsin with me, I was like, right, what do I know? Laverne and Shirley, you know, that was yeah. it. it. And the Fonz, you know, that was literally it. You know, I didn't know <laughs> anything else about Wisconsin. And then I went over the first time I ever went to Minneapolis. We went there, we trained for one day, and then we drove to Wisconsin. This is how naive I was. Because uh, I was like, are we going to be able to get a taxi or how are we going to get there? And it was like, I was only down the road. And I was like, right, okay. So we drive for an hour, then two hours, then three hours, 
that's three and a half hours. And I'm like, down the road. Like, yeah, it's only the next state across. And you're like, dude, like, I could be halfway across the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and you think this is only down the road. And, you know, went there and, like, Lake Owen was amazing. But again, it, it, it was one of those, it was like, like, Kurt, you know, we, we went we went in there one night and there was some of the, it, it was the biggest room of whoopass I've ever had the pleasure of being in. We went on our last night, we used to go to this place. I think it was called, was it Lakewoods or Pinewoods or something? But it was, it was, it was, it was sort of like a, basically it needed to have a bar on the side called the Double Deuce because that's how hillbilly this place was, right? And we were in there and uh, there was a plumbers convention and these plumbers walked in and they were a bit rowdy. And then we were like, and I was looking at it, it was so surreal because I'm like, I'm with all these world-class martial artists and these poor plumbers are walking in, they don't know. But I'm thinking, how, how's a kid from Coventry traveled like, what, eight and a half, 9,000 miles and I'm in the middle of all of this and it's so surreal. Yeah, you're people, basically in like a honky tonk bar in the middle of the woods, you know. Yeah, full of and that, just yeah, but Kurt, counties that are not happy that you're there. The bar is having the biggest night of their year, no doubt about it. But everybody who's coming back the next day is not happy that we've showed up for that night, you know. But yeah, but, yeah, so but, I think is an interesting thing of like this. Uh, let's touch on this for a second. So for context, we don't need to give the whole story about what this training camp was. But some of the experience is unique, but maybe Nathan, you can shed light on maybe it's not that unique. So this was a, a summer camp for, I think, mostly for kids. It was actually a religious summer camp. We would get there at the end of their season. Their season was done. So it was like the end of the summer. And part of our job was to help them break down all the bunks and the bunk houses and help kind of get the winterize the camp a little bit. And then we could have the run of the place. And what was interesting is it was also, it's a very high level or it was a very high level training grounds for gymnasts, which is the, the spaces that we would train in on the gymnastic floors. And then they had uh, dirt tracks <clears throat> and, and different ramps and stuff for BMX riders and for skateboarders, right? So there's a lot of other things that happen there, but primarily it served as this youth camp. Um, we wound up having this lakeside camping experience as part of a training camp with food bonfires every night there's a hot tub there with a bunch of weird stuff probably happen you know so we're training all day hanging out drinking beer by the the lake all night sort of thing in this really unique place literally in the middle of a forest in the middle of nowhere you know uh, kind of flyover state america type of thing and that's so different to me than going to a gym and training for three days, which is also really obviously great and valuable. And we all do those things, but having a destination training where there's not a lot of tourism to be had around, you know, if you, you have a destination training in Rome or Hawaii or something, you're going to want to spend a lot of time traveling because you, you made a point to go all the way there where this is, there's nothing to do, but, you know, enjoy nature for a little bit maybe go for a swim and then beat each other up for a while. And it's an experience that all of us remember with extreme fondness as some of the best times of our life. Because when you talk about a shared experience, Mick and I literally became friends at this camp. You know, I got to know him and so many other people that are some of the dearest people in my life today because of that. And I, I would hazard a guess that if that camp experience that training experience was just at the gym those dynamics would have been different that shared experience would have been different that's interesting yeah i think there's a lot of different ways to travel there are people who go and move abroad and train there's people who go and teach and do seminars i mean you mentioned dan's like kind of having like a a tour where he all kind of goes around and does the same circuit obviously you got people like john will who do the same thing they go to the same gyms and go around um and then, yeah, there's visiting friends clubs, there's visiting clubs because you're in a city already and you just drop by and then training camps and retreats like that. And I know they're becoming a lot more popular um, in the jiu-jitsu world. You get a lot of like surf and jiu-jitsu camps and things like that. So, they, so there's, a, cool. like on a beach, uh, some, um, there's also the Globetrotters group, which is quite big in jiu-jitsu and they, um, they, they, they have, they're all over the world and it's they, they pull instructors from all different clubs and do like 
you know, big camps like summer and fall camps where they hire a big place out. I don't know, they're becoming more popular too. And um, Nathan, but, those are at different locations every time? Yeah, they're all over the world. Yeah, That's I've never cool. been, I, I haven't really been to these kind of training camps or anything like that. I've visited gyms and I've taught at gyms, but I've never really gone to a training it, camp. For many why are we not, on. okay, next episode, we'll be discussing the Woma Globetrotters camp. <laughs> <laughs> coming to a destination funny. resort near you <laughs> it's funny the um we've all mentioned we've never none of us have mentioned like learning techniques when you go somewhere learning drills stuff like that all we've talked about is the experiences of it and i think that is the thing and one of the things is all the people you meet you said about you guys making friends all the contacts you make um and i i love having gone somewhere and then recommending it you know i've been out to america and then i've had students be in america and go and visit the same gyms and be oh you know i'm from that gym back and they're like oh yeah from nathan's place and things like that um i love that that you can kind of have that little network around the world and know people in all these different countries to that end like this is something i was knowing we were going to talk about this that's the thought that i kept circling around is when I get together with a lot of my uh, friends and training partners like you guys from at camps and at these different, uh, you know, seminars and destinations, a lot of it is a bit of a reunion. And I may have talked about this on the show before, so apologies if I did, but there was one year that we talked about the Lake Owen camp, and this is for MKG International and MKG, you know, if somebody's listening or watching and they don't know, there's, it's just like a, a global family of martial artists. It's about 10,000 people around the world. And so every year we would do this destination training camp. They sold the, the location, the camp. So now it's at the MKG headquarters, which is in Minneapolis. That's where I used to train. I came up there. And uh, the, one of the last times we were there, Mickey, I think it was kind of our fault that this came up. But everyone is serious about their training. But when all of us get together, we're pretty serious about the reunion part right we're pretty serious about not being too serious and that's one of the major themes for mkg in general and at one point mick i think it's when we were demoing rick stops and was like like i'm not upset but are you guys more interested in training or in like just seeing one another you know it was like just that so was, i know how to run this thing for the next few days and we're like uh the training you know but it hit me i was like we almost should stop calling this the summer camp or the training camp and just call it the mkg family reunion because a lot of these events they they can have that feel if the culture of your group is that way if you're a pretty serious group or it's like a fight camp or something these are different dynamics in place but if the culture of your group in general is that way that's some of the best part. And for me, I kind of go back to, again, each training camp or seminar experience being different. I know if I'm in class, I'm going to get an abundance of techniques and training and drilling and repeating that. And so I could go to the camp and go, now I'm going to get a massive volume of that. But some part of me, if I'm honest, goes, okay, it's a massive chunk of what I'm already getting. But what I'm not already getting is this interaction, is the back and forth and exchange of ideas with other martial artists from other places, some of the different cultural perspectives, as we, as we said earlier, and just the joy of getting together with like-minded people. As a kid growing up, I didn't have a lot, of, I didn't have anybody I could talk to about martial art because I didn't have martial art friends. Get Training as an adult was the first time, and I, I have vivid memory of the moment it struck me of like, I met my people. Holy shit, this is amazing. I found my, my, the weirdos that are like me and the same, the weird about the same stuff, you know? And so these gatherings can be an opportunity for some of that to, to be rewarding in that way, you know? And I don't think it takes away from the experience. It's not for everyone. And you can always see the couple of people that maybe are a little bit disappointed and they, they are just there to train and they don't really care about your, your grab assy song and dance good time you're trying to have, you know, and I, I totally respect that. But for me, sometimes that's the break that I need. And I'll add to that, if you're not otherwise able to uh, take a lot of vacations, you know, right, go on a lot of holidays, if you're not, um, like I, my wife and I laugh, I mean, I, I can't think of the amount of trips I must owe her because every time we travel, it has to do with martial art, right? And so 
I kind of want to build some fun and some R and R into that experience because it's the only time I'm going to really go somewhere. Is some of these things, uh, Mick. I know you at first um, had said you'd had something to add, and Nathan, I, I'm curious to get your take on that as well. Uh, literally, it's just as you were saying it there about the travel. Um, I when Nathan was saying before about the collection of techniques. Um, I've got this thing. I, I, I bear in mind it is this has paid me back in spades, right? Because when I came back from my first ever Minneapolis uh, trip and we went to Lake Owen, I came back and my wife was like, well, yeah, that cost quite a lot, Mick. W what did you actually learn? And so what I did was, I like, the one thing I remember was, I, the one thing I can remember was that I, as I always say, I, I'm that good at teaching you how to beat people up. I'm going to teach you how to beat somebody up with their own arm. So Nathan, you've seen me do this. I do it all the time. I do it in every single class. Ever. So I've had my money back. At, I swear to God, it's like buying Tesla stock on day one. You know, I do that parry and bridge, do the gargi, grab the guy's head and just feed him back his own arm. And the, even my wife was like, well, that's pretty impressive. And I went, that's a thousand dollar technique right there. Cause that's how much it cost me to learn that one technique. Uh, so first of all, not just because it's an anecdote, it's the fact that uh, that then set in stone that every time I ever did, any time I ever did any sort of uh, trip, I always thought to myself, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I remember one technique. And then obviously with the, with, with the whole travel thing, it's a bit bizarre because once I really enjoyed it, then that was up to me then to get everybody that I knew into into it like and i try to explain to people you, you you won't believe this and they're like but what will you learn and i'm like uh it, it isn't about the martial arts it's about the people and they're like you can learn martial arts anywhere like they're like and that i, I don't I, I know that sounds really bad and i hope i'm not going to sound patronizing or insulting but you can like especially nowadays like we, we we're not in the, we're not in the age where if i use nathan as an example you know one of the reasons why nathan was so good at coaching was because necessity was the mother of invention. Everything was either on a DVD or from a book. So it, you know you didn't have a guy down the road who had a, like a brown belt or a black belt jujitsu game. So you had to do this. So like I, I think we're way ahead of the curve on that. And I, I, I yeah, I don't want to sound big headed, but I knew immediately from day one what I got into. It. As soon as I met the MKG group, I was like, this is what I want because it was martial arts. I really enjoyed it. It was fun. I got to travel the world, which bragging rights alone is great. Because when people say, so you do martial arts, what do you do? And I'm like, uh, well, you know, I get to travel the world. I've been every every continent. And they're like, but but are you any good in a fight? And I'm like, that's pretty limited thinking you got there, my old mate. You know what I mean? I'm not really into it for that. You know, because I learned that in the first six months. You know, what I've got now is, you know, you know, you know, you know, the whole thing. It's like, you know civilize the mind make savage the body all of that shit and i buy into all of that and it was like what so you're going to learn thai boxing and not understand thai culture and, and yeah again that's the teaching thing that's what i loved about it and it just uh, if anything it just gave me a better world view nathan leverton yeah you both brought up a whole bunch of points there that i think sum up a lot of what i feel about traveling and training you know kurt was saying about like you know vacations and it being a, a training vacation and stuff but it's the break from routine you know that break from routine the break from the life that you normally have not in any way denigrating the life that you have but especially being a coach and stuff it can be a grind when it, you know and that's another point like the part of the grind is that you're trying to help other people god damn the chance to be a student sometimes oh my god like like it's, it's great it's, it can be weird and stressful and i find it awkward to do sometimes kind of be the student and be made to do things that you don't want to do like when was the last time you actually had to do that you know there was a coach saying to do something in it that kind of forces you and it, it shows you what it's like to be a student again sometimes um and one thing mick was saying was the uh yeah you can train anywhere i know matt thornton said a lot about this before he's like you know, Matt doesn't like the idea of like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and American Jiu Jitsu. He's like, you know, you don't have like Brazilian math. Like, it's just if it works, it works. And I remember him saying many years ago, I mean, I, I'm going to paraphrase it with Wing Chun, but it, it might not have been saying something nasty about Wing Chun. But I remember basically him saying, look, 
you know you can train properly and you can do that at home with your training partners or whatever and you can go all the way to china and train wing chun there and still be shit because you're training something that's not going to work kind of thing like you can travel all the way across the world and still do training methods it's still you and a body in training like you can do that really good any anywhere um and you can do bad training anywhere too so it's not necessarily about that but the chance to be a student that's that does make a big difference yeah and i like the the idea of traveling to be a student is something that's really starting to after 2020 <clears throat> is really taking hold in me again, you know, um, and the idea of traveling to train not a martial art, but with an individual, you know, what I mean, knowing like, like, because this is the interesting thing. So I, I said before, I just started doing formal traditional karate for the first time. And uh, the we can talk about it later, but the, I don't want to get too much into it. The, the teacher that I'm with is from the Karate Kid movies. He's in the in the first, and maybe he's got an appearance in the third one. But um, but I wanted to do that in part because I grew up really a huge fan of this individual, and so it's such a cool opportunity because of Zoom, because of the format we're using now, where I can do this and I can train privately with him every week without having to fly to California. Right. So obviously it, it, it saves me a fortune, but, oh, I'm chomping at the bit now to fly out to California and hang out with them, you know? And so now all of a sudden I kind of had this thing where I'm like, yeah, who, who else, how can I set up some of these relationships and travel to learn more, not necessarily about an art, but from individuals or practitioners or artists where I really value their perspective or am just a fan of theirs in whatever way. Um, the idea of being a student again, we're always students, and you know, of course, the whole time. And, and But taking on a new subject has been great. One thing I noticed right away, not to be too tangential, but he was talking about, he was teaching me some uh, just basic kicks from a karate perspective. It was like, you know, a lot of people will talk about this part of karate kicking is not good. And, you know, a Thai box will say this is this is garbage and this is why. And But I, I told him, I said, look, here's my take on that stuff. Every time somebody says, explains to me what their kicking is like, Thai boxing, sabat, whatever, they're saying, this is why it's better than karate, or it's not like karate for this reason. So for an art that people are saying something bad about, they're pretty obsessed with referencing it. So to me, I want to know what it is, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not I'd use it. I don't care about that part. I want to know why is this such a significant factor in the way that we understand martial art as an international community of people, you know, that's the juice to me is to, to get some of that essence and try to figure out, you know, why is this the core or the beginning route for so many people? And then it's the litmus test that so many people bat things against. And right away, I realized I didn't know anything that I thought I knew about this art. So it's been invaluable so far. You said about going and seeing individuals. And first of all, I think that's a great thing about martial arts. You have access to individuals that in other sports you wouldn't. I remember someone saying like in jiu-jitsu, it's like you can't, like, you, you know, jiu-jitsu, you can go to a seminar with Bradley Ostima or Marcelo Garcia or a few different people. You know, you can't go and like for 20 quid, 30, you know, 30 bucks, something, go and like do a, you know, if you're into golf, go and play with Tiger Woods. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I learned from you. Yeah. Like you just can't do it. Um, but also, so, you know, one thing about traveling to see these people is... Sorry to interrupt you, Nathan. That is, that's the tagline for the episode. That is a huge <laughs> point that never gets talked about. You know what I mean? Like if you're into basketball, you get to train with Phil Jackson. No, that's not a thing. You know, we always hear with Dan and Asano, it's like Michael Jordan showing up in your hometown to teach you a little bit about basketball. And by the way, don't complain about the price when Michael Jordan shows up in your town to teach you basketball. You know? well, the thing is, as well, like I was, I was about to say as well, like you, because the thing is, they're not going to be around forever. Yeah. That's the other thing as well. And you can do it and you can do it now. Like I remember, like I mentioned Billy Robinson earlier. So I, I had Billy, Billy at my gym a couple of times and I went out and, you know, I, I did one of his classes at the gym in Arkansas and I hung out with him, went out for sushi, went out for drinks, went back to his flat, had drinks, told stories, that kind of stuff. But, you know, he's passed now. He's gone. Like that experience, like I could never have that again. The chance to do something like that is just... Like that's gold. That's one of my favorite memories of martial arts is getting to spend a little, just a little bit of time with him and getting on with him. Yeah. The fact that I'm learning from a guy from Karate Kid who was, we called him the real guy in the movie when I was a kid, but 
the fact that I then got to know him in this format via Zoom and was like, we have a lot of stuff in common. And in another context, we probably could be friends. And holy shit, you know, somebody tell five-year-old me that you guys are kind of buddies to a degree, you know, like, like that, that's an amazing experience that definitely as a kid growing up who also loved basketball, that's not an opportunity I'll ever have. The magic about, you know, travel, right? First of all, I always reference Guru Dan because I always say he calls me Mike because they go, you know, Bruce Lee's best friend. And I went, yeah, he calls me Mike. But he was best. He was Bruce Lee's best friend. He almost gets my name right. And the crack is that yeah, I'm a kid from Coventry. I shouldn't have even. I shouldn't even be in this orbit. But there's this picture I put up on Facebook, and it's myself, Rick Fay, Lee Taylor, and Guru Dan. And we did a seminar in Minneapolis. You've met Lee, Kurt, you know him, right? right. And <laughs> yeah, and the way the way the, 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 the it's a cool story. I have to share it. We're there and he's just in awe. He's never seen Dan in Osanto in his life. And we're doing a knife tapping drill and he just can't, he just can't get it because he's so starstruck. And he says, Mick, can you just show me this? And I, I got the drill, but I, you know, it, was, you know, it was one of the very early parts of the progression with Guru. And I said, well, I'm not getting it either. Let's go and just speak to the man. And it was that look on, his, on, on Lee's face when it was like, what? And I went over and as soon as I said, uh, Guru, and he turned around and he went, Mike. So I winked then at Lee because I'd already told Lee that he, you know, he called me Mike. And he, I winked like that. I said, Guru, it's great to see you. I said, this is my dear friend, Lee. Uh, he's not getting the drill. And the next thing you know, you've got Daniel Osanto got his, put his hands on Lee Taylor. Lee Taylor's going, wow. And then we get this picture at the end of it. And I put it up on Facebook and I put a tagline underneath which said, if I could only show a 16-year-old Mick Tully this picture. And like that, and, and like that sums up everything to me about why you should travel. Because it's like, you know, if I hadn't if I hadn't traveled to Minneapolis, I that picture wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't and like and again, I it, I use it as a throwaway thing where I'm like, yeah, you know, I just get to go to America. I you know, it means so much to me. But if you put too much emphasis on it, then this sounds really cliched. But if you put too much emphasis on it and make it seem like, um, I have to be very careful the way I say this now. You know, when you see, we've, we've all got contemporaries in martial arts who they, they try and pretend that going to another country and traveling is sort of like Indiana Jones level adventuring. You know, like they're fucking Alan Quaterman. I, I mean, it's like, they're like, you, no, you got on a bus with wings, mate. You had three meals and drank beer on the way over there. You're not an adventurer, but you know, they do it. So it almost can put some people off doing it. Where you know, I always play it down to make it more accessible. And then I always say to people, why wouldn't you want to travel? Yeah, you, you, you're prepared to go to Thailand for a holiday. Why won't you go to Thailand and do Muay Thai? Yeah, you want to go to Brazil. Okay, why don't you go and do Jiu Jitsu? Nathan, you had a point there, mate. Yeah, we were just uh, obviously the two of us were down in London just the other day with, and we had had food with our friends, including Bob Breen. And obviously, I only kind of have any contact with Bob because you know he's done seminars at friends you know, places. And in fact, like I knew, you know, places like Tony Davis because I'd been down there and taught down there. I travelled down there, and he travelled up to see me. And then when he's got Bob down there, I've travelled down and trained on Bob's seminars. And again, all these links have only happened because of traveling back and forth and doing seminars and chatting to people. And without any of that, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to go down there. When I came back, I mean, I've, I've misquoted Kanye West a few times. Like he once said his life was dope and he does dope shit. And I once kind of half said ages ago, it's like, yeah, you, you want to like, you know, do dope shit with dope people. And when I came back from London and people saw the photos at the gym, one of my lads, Ben was like, you were doing dope shit with dope people, weren't you? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I was. Yeah. <clears throat> I've had that. So I was just, you had me thinking about this and this is, that's not how I would have thought about it, but it just distracted me because that's, that's another really, really important point that we don't maybe talk about enough in general in the martial art world is the, 
I don't want to say like, oh, it's a blessing or a gift, but whatever the right word for every individual is, the fact that you get to do that. You know what I mean? Like to me, one of the greatest things I would want over money or anything else is just access to stuff like that. And having the opportunity, Mick, you're somebody who's really drilled this home for me, the opportunity to share space and time and maybe a meal uh, with some of your heroes or with, with people that you look up to or that you admire in, in, your, in your chosen field. That's, that's really rare. And that's a cool opportunity. I've had that like, you know, going out for a meal with a group of people with Guru Dan after a seminar with Dan and Asano. And once or twice, I found myself sitting next to him or across from him or whatever. The most uncomfortable meals I'll ever have because I'm like hands shaking, trying to eat pasta. Like, what do you say to this? Like, uh, do you also like pasta? I like it. You know, <laughs> like, since there's no way I'm going to be cool here, it's best to just kind of keep your head down and, and shut your mouth, you know. Um, but, I, you know, I've had, I'm curious to get your guys' take on, on this part of it. One person who, in my experience, when he comes to town, so we've had Mal Morney here in town. We've talked about him on the show before uh, several times. And a good friend of mine and I uh, bring him out and, uh, or have brought him out in the past uh, several times. And so I've found through those experiences that, I love the training, but I love Maul, right? Like he's somebody who now I can't believe is a friend of mine and is uh, just just one of my favorite people out there. I, his art is beautiful. It's captivating. It's compelling. It's action packed. It looks like you're inside of a movie screen the whole time. It's It's remarkable. But as a person, I just love when he comes to town. The friend of mine that would always help bring him out, he's in a better financial position than, than I am. And so he has the means to to do things like that facilitate some of those training experiences one of the things he had said to me was either i can spend x amount of money and travel to see mall or i can spend more or less that same amount of money and bring him here to us and other people can share in that experience too which i thought was pretty selfless and an interesting perspective and i'm curious your guys's take on that would you be more interested if you had just, you know, all, all resources being equal, would you rather travel to train with that person or bring that person into your sphere? Oh, wow. Big question. Um, I, I don't really train much anymore, especially with the stuff that I teach because of my health. Um, but, and when we first opened, I did bring a lot of people in, um, you know, Ryan Hall, Dean Lister, John Will, James Wilkes, just, you know, uh, Pablo Popovich, just lots and lots of different names. And it was great for the gym. It was great. And some of them stayed for a few days and um, it was great for my students, but I got to admit that doesn't stay with me the same as when I've traveled somewhere. Um, the, again, all the things we talked about exposure to culture and seeing different people train and being made to do stuff you don't want to do and like overcome all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the travel and the trip and the break from the life and all that stuff I find much more rewarding for me as an individual and probably the, again the prestige of having tra traveled and trained with other people and been around a little bit um and also again all the things we talked about like networking you meet uh, you know if you bring an instructor to your gym you're not meeting many other students you know um like sometimes you run one in like with someone else like we had john wayne Paul not that long ago so then another gym were there and they had to help arrange it so um we met them but when you when it's just you rocking up you might not know anybody and that's yeah. a that's a whole big bunch of networking and different faces and different people and different experiences you can have so me rewarding wise i would prefer to go somewhere and, and train but um but bringing someone in is good for your students and it's good for the name of your gym if you can say look here's a photo of this guy in a lesser shoot t-shirt under a lesser shoot fighters banner at my gym and everyone knows who it is it does you know i've had like vanderlei silver down i've had different people down it helps it does help the first time Maul was in my first gym, Eric, that I, I hosted with, leaned over and he was like, <clears throat> "Holy shit, Maul Morty's in your gym!" I was like, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> click, 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 selfies, you know, like that kind of thing. Do you, uh, Mick? I want to get your take on this too. But Nathan, do you like? Do you relish in when you are training the thing of showing up at a place and having some of that anonymity, where you're just a student there on the mat training? You're able to meet people and expand your network. 
but like there's a lot of duties and a lot of responsibility involved with hosting somebody. I find I train the least when I'm hosting somebody for a seminar because there's a lot of other things in place. You're trying to figure out dinner reservations or whatever, whatever, um, where or other people are like, you know, if there's someone from a school from four hours away in my state and then they're like, who is this guy that's bringing him in? And they're kind of checking me out and I feel maybe a little more anxious about it because that's how I am where if I just roll up to somebody else's school, I'm just some dude on the mat and nobody's paying attention to me. I, I like that. It, it, does that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, depends on the person. Sometimes I may already have a slight relationship with the person because maybe sure. they've been mine or something. And that can be bad because you rock up, you like, maybe you bring one of your students with you and you're at the back and stuff. And then the instructor is just about to teach and he's like, oh, there's someone <laughs> like, I remember Ryan Hall being down and Ryan Hall's like one of the best grapplers in the world. Obviously he's in the UFC now and stuff like that. And I remember him, you know, but I'm like, right, I'm just gonna do a bit of training at the back. I'm kind of, I've got him in my gym, but I'm gonna be here. And he's like, so, you know, when I started grappling, I I used to watch Nathan's VHS tapes on grappling. <laughs> like, oh, for sake. like, you know, like, you know, and you get that sense of someone will point you out and then it's like, everyone's kind of looking at you. But um, yeah, it is nice when you can disappear a little bit. And, uh, and it's great when you're training with someone else who maybe knows the instructor as well. And then like, like Mick said, they can kind of bring that person over and introduce you and things. And that, that's really nice, you know. Yeah, it's it's just cool. We're listening to that both of you both of you guys with the take there. It's um, it's it's funny for me because uh, getting guys in, I'll tell you right now, uh, you never make any money. That's that's you know from a business point of view, you never do because no matter what happens, it's like you know if you look like you're making a few quid on that seminar, then guess what? It's like yeah, let's go to it. Let's go order everything you want off the menu you know it's one of those because you because the experience is that good you're like i don't really care me personally i'll tell you right now um selfishly if i want to learn anything nathan knows this because he's seen me do it several times john will's come over i've hosted him a few times uh but i'll follow him on every single seminar that he's got because that, I, that's where you'll learn stuff um but right now uh, especially before covid uh, the first time I met Daniel Lanero, that was where I was like, right, I'm going to have to get Daniel to come to Coventry. For the simple reason, I just I just wanted somebody, I, I, yeah, I, it just one guy from my school to just have that moment of going, holy shit. Because when you see that guy move, you're like, what what have I just seen here? And then, so, uh, the, you know, a couple of names I have to throw out. Like, it's like when you see John Will, first time you ever see John Will teach and you you teach yourself, you, you're just like, shit, man, there's levels to this game. So it's like, it's like Wayne Stokes is like, wet, my, my dear friend Wayne Stokes gets John for the simple reason, just so that he can watch him teach. He doesn't care about doing any training when he's when he's with him. And he said, it's, it's that, it's that, car ride to the next venue that's where the, that's where the money is right uh so it with me it's a two it's a double thing i, I won't i won't lie to you i i really struggle with it sometimes because i'm like right i really know that my friends and my students will love this but selfishly i would just love to have it all for me and again that, like, that poses some real serious questions to you as a person you know what i mean and like i'm quite lucky because i'm able to do both I really would be, I, I, I wouldn't like to be in the, you know, the quandary of going, so is it selfish, Mick, you know, devil, angel, which one do I listen to? Because you know what? I'm listening to the guy with the ACDC soundtrack because the devil's the one who always wins with me. I'm yeah. like, yeah, mate, let's go train him. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, just, it, it, it's just cool. You know, the travel thing's amazing. You're getting to meet people you'd never, ever meet, Kurt. Like we would have never, ever met if we hadn't gone to Minneapolis. Yeah, but but you know this is like this is a crazy thing. Nathan will tell you, I live twenty five minutes away from Nathan, but that could be for some people, twenty five minutes is far too far to travel. You know, well, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I hadn't come over to Coventry to to Jeff stuff, if I just stayed in Leicester, we we never would have met. No, we wouldn't have met. And you know, again, it's like uh, you know, I know this brings it from where we've gone halfway around the globe to I have. I have friends of mine who cannot work out that for 10 years, I drive 35 minutes up the road 
but bear in mind it's it's motorway all the way listening to a podcast or listening to country and western or having time to myself which is a joy anyway uh to go and train with neil simkin they're like you do that like three four times a week and you're like dude i did a 180 mile round trip for nine years to train with terry barnett and the reason i did that was because rick Fay said to me how far has terry barnett lived from you and i went uh, about 90 miles away and he went what and you don't train with him on a weekly basis and he went shame on you mick and i went 90 miles rick 90 miles most people haven't traveled 90 miles in their life in the country that i'm from i said that that's far too far and then that that got the old cogs going a little bit and i'm like yeah yeah 180 miles like to a midwestern american you know what i mean yeah you'll go that far to get a good steak i think won't you you know what i mean yeah, that that's the plan yep. this weekend, actually. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, one thing I wanted to tack on to this, I feel like we would be remiss, as this is the Woma show, and this is the world of martial art, and we have, as always, quietly creeping in the background, the uh, host with the most, our producer Will Henshaw, who is somebody who has traveled or has um, helped facilitate, like for Umic and other people traveling and learning martial art from other martial artists. Um, one, I would like to hear, Will, if you don't mind quickly, just giving us your take on the significance of training or, or travel with martial art. And then I just have a quick into WOMA is the fact that it's sort of highlighting cultural arts a lot of times in the culture that they're from, right? Not always the case, but there's some sense of like, this isn't just some guy doing a martial art and showing us some techniques. We're kind of learning about uh, how the art functions, where it comes from. There's some depth to the productions that you've given. Uh, Will, how do you feel on the topic? Nicely handed over there. Um, an honor to be appearing when I first got into martial arts and in the same way, you do end up falling in love with it. And then you begin to want to know more where it where did it come from why did they originate doing what they do and why do they still do it and what do they eat for dinner and what do they wear and why do they bow and why do they wear those funny white pajamas what's that, what's that about so that was part of uh, that whole process along with way of the warrior which i saw when i was a lot younger and um, mind body kick-ass moves was my attempt to make the same thing and to answer those questions that had come up with my training um, so it was very much a sort of a, a pilgrimage to go and find all those places and people I'd partly read or seen some of them online, others I'd heard about. Um, uh, and it was as it was, well, it was part of my, my dream come true. It was unfortunate we had a presenter in the way that we did, um, but you know, you can't get everything right all the time. Um, and a lot of the things that you talked about, that pleasure of just meeting people, um, Unfortunately, when we were there for the program, it was quite difficult producing it and filming it and directing it. So it's a very different process, but it was just nice meeting people of that same mindset. And that was a sense of what World of Martial Arts has become is my attempt to keep that idea going, that there's a lot of stuff out there that I like and I think other people will like and want to find out more about. And that's sort of the thing I still get when I've been and trained elsewhere and uh, have trained in various seminars all over the place and it is that thing that you've always mentioned that just the pleasure of meeting people with the same mind finding things out about and how to move and how to do things differently um it's uh i can't wrap it up very well but uh, it's been a pleasure and that's been my whole my whole point of doing what uh water martial arts television is to try and replicate uh that sense that there's a world out there that uh, needs to be explored See, and so I'm, I'm so glad that I asked. I'm so glad that was your answer. I kind of thought it might be, but because that's what's always drawn me to WOMA as an enterprise, as a project, um, why I've always been so excited to be able to be a part of this show is, you know, you can learn techniques anywhere. We have YouTube now um, and techniques can be rather universal. When you zoom out enough and look at enough martial arts, you realize a body can only move so many ways, et cetera, et cetera. But understanding the why understanding the like you said what do they eat what do they you know all that all of that stuff to me is endlessly fascinating so mick and nathan i'm curious as a last topic your take on the value of and, and maybe you don't find there's much value which is totally fine um 
in going to a place to learn that cultural art, if we consider martial arts through the lens of a cultural art in that culture. So Mick, I think it was you that said earlier, you know, if you're going to go to Thailand for a holiday, why not do Muay Thai there? And there's obviously a lot of people now, a lot of people who do like Muay Thai tourism and that maybe that's uh, kind of a fabrication or whatever, but you know, I'm really interested, the five, six, 10, 11 year old in me, that's still the goal. That's the goal that's left for me, right? I, I was able to, I had to close it, but I was able to have a school. I was able to do all these different things beyond the show, things that, that were dreams and goals of mine through martial art. I was not interested in fighting. I was interested in these other things. The one that still remains is going to the places these arts are from, maybe even in up to the specific locations, whether it's a, a temple or a school, a dojo, whatever, and really immersing myself, even if just for a few days in that place to get a sense of how this works and, and tap into the source of that. Does that resonate for you guys? And if so, what are one or two on your list of things that you like, man, one day, you know, whether it's bucket list or if I had a bunch of money, where do I want to go or what art do I want to steep myself into? I think now it would be more going to see someone teach and just being able to see excellence in coaching and see some, how someone commands a room and how somebody structures a session and how they, the, the flow of like how they progress and, um, how they describe things and those kind of things. That's what I would love to go and see. But it's kind of weird to rock up at a gym and just go, I just want to want to see you teach a class. Um, <laughs> but I'd be happy to pay for that. Like that's, you know, my favorite things over the last few years, again, because I'm not really training myself, is watching, you know, people like John Will teach. Like that's that's what inspires me to go back and do like, you know, if, I, if I'm on the mats, you know, I was on the mats this morning, I was on the mats this evening, I'm there teaching. You know, that's what I want to get better at. That's what I want to work on. So if I was if I was traveling anywhere, it would be to see somebody coach. And like what we were talking about earlier is, you know, that that idea of traveling to see a martial artist as opposed to a martial art or whatever. You know what I mean? Traveling to focus on that that individual. I, for one, cannot wait until the Nathan Leverton's book a master class of coaching or whatever comes out you know i'll be first one to buy the book man because i think that's amazing and as good of a coach as you clearly are by reputation and just getting to know you the idea of somebody like you traveling with that intention to help share teaching to help share coaching as opposed to the art is another side of that thing that that doesn't get touched on much so that i'm thrilled that you answered thank you well, I think as an instructor, they might, how many times have you been on a seminar and someone's teaching something and you're like, wow, I've seen that before. And then they describe it in a certain way to the class and you're like, yeah, I'm stealing that. Like the amount of, the amount of times, like especially in a room with other coaches and you look at each other like, yeah, that, that drill is going to be on a class on Monday, you know? <laughs> Nick, yeah. how about you? What, you know, is there, do you have stones that you haven't yet turned over? Does the idea of, you know, destination traveling, immersive experiences like that, trying to go to the source, does that appeal to you? But yeah, bucket list, boys. The bucket list is Nathan this side, Kurt this side, Will's filming, and Amazon Prime are paying us the big <laughs> dollar. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah, pray to the God of Jeff Bezos. You are a benevolent God, Jeff. Look after us, man. Make sure we hashtag that guy in, Jeff Bezos, benevolent God. All right, and then we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get we'll get picked up on that. Yeah, but did I go off on a tangent there? Probably yeah, did, boys. a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a no lot. idea how to bring us home now. Sorry, I was all primed and ready to go. <laughs> bring it home, Kirk. <laughs> Not to make it sort of a painful jump to bring it together, but the pop culture part of it. Right. And how it's, you, you're talking about golf and stuff. Those are still really valuable experiences as martial artists, because those are reasons we got into this stuff. You know, and how cool is it to be able to go to a place that you've seen in a movie? Like to me, where that's there's a synthesis of both of those ideas. There's a series of Cambodian kickboxing videos that I love that are filmed in Angkor Wat. Like, how cool is it? Or when you see scenes like that in films, you know, and, and you're seeing a fight scene take place in that space, you know, to have that as a backdrop. I think 
aren't they there in Kickboxer 2 with Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, or a place that looks similar, um, you know, with the, the same kind of uh, building structures and stuff like that. There, there has to be something, I, for me at least, uh, that is my bucket list. That's, that's the thing I hope I can do now in the rest of my life is go to some of those places and have some of those experiences, whether they're kind of fun or funny things that remind me of the films or the martial art music and stuff like that, that I love the pop culture things or the, the literal culture itself and the origin of some of those things. When I was young, you know, a teenager, I have a distinct memory of one of my aunts being like, so you're going to graduate high school here in a few months. Uh, what's your plan? And I said, I'm going to study massage therapy so I can study Chinese medicine so I can travel abroad and learn martial art. I, I lived in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea how to, it was really before the internet. So I was like, I don't know how to make it work, but it sounds to me like that might, I could network my way into traveling around and doing martial art. Then I saw shows like Fight Quest come out where it's like, Two guys that are friends that get to pal around the world, go to these places, they fight each other a little bit at the end, and then they get paid for. I'm like, this is amazing. My heart kind of broke because I'm like, well, that was my idea, you know? And now here we are on Will's show. Here we are in the world of martial art, <clears throat> and we're able to, even through the internet, have this sort of abbreviated experience where we're able to share some of that perspective. We're able to not immerse in culture, but to learn about each other's culture and each other's um, viewpoints and seeing some of the things that you guys have done together Mick and Will it's rewarding to know that some of those opportunities and some of the uh, people that share those ideas still exist they're still out there you know today we've been talking about what it's like to travel the world learning martial art and there couldn't be a more relevant topic for the world of martial arts show this is the Woma show we're us your youth thank you for watching Podcast Network. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.